Welcome to Head First with Dr. Hill. Uh, this is one of the first episodes of our brand new video podcast, and we are pleased to welcome to the show today Jesse Lawler of Smart Drug Smarts, a podcast that I've actually been a guest on a few times. So, thanks Jesse, for having me. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming down and uh, to be here. Uh, visiting the studio. We actually spent uh, a few hours earlier today in our office over at Peak Brain, yep. uh, mapping Jesse's brain and. Uh, for those folks who don't know, uh, Jesse's a biohacker extraordinaire and ha- tends to keep his fingers in lots of different pies throughout the uh, biohacking space. True. And you have a lot of uh, uh, guests come through your own show. Yeah. So uh, for, why don't you, uh, in, you know, let the, um, you can introduce yourself to, to our uh, viewing audience. Sure. Well, yeah, I, I started my podcast probably about the same time we met because you were one of my, my early guests. That's right. And uh, I'm a software developer by training. That's sort of, you know, what I put on my tax returns mm-hmm, when I filed mm-hmm. them. And, um, you know, as a, as a software developer, I, I heard probably about 10 years ago of sort of the concept of smart drugs. It was something called Provigil or Modafinil mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that I first heard about, which was kind of the, the first time I'd ever been exposed to the idea that there might be substances you can put into your body that make your brain work better in some senses sure, rather sure. than worse. And that just, you know, got my curiosity and... Um, you know, always as a software developer, you're looking for ways to kind of, you know, lock in your attention for an extended period of time, really kind of put on the, uh, the mm-hmm. mental blinders. And so, yeah, that piqued my curiosity. I wound up ordering some, you know, I, I guess, you know, illicit modafinil sure, from sure. a Canadian pharmacy. This was, you know, back in probably 2005, 2006. Back and when you could still do that. Yeah, yeah. back when you yeah, could still do yeah. that. Now, now it's coming from India rather than from Canada, typically. But um, yeah, anyway, that started me down the road sort of as a, um, you know, I guess, a practitioner. Yeah. And then about three years ago, started actually calling up people like yourself, neuroscientists and researchers at different academic institutions and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And um, just learning everything that I could about this and sort of doing it in the public context. So we're coming up on almost four years that we've had the podcast now, 140 yeah, some guests. It's, it's been pretty good. Yeah, it was one of your, your earlier ones. I mean, I think we had just launched True Brain. Uh, yeah. Maybe three, four months after uh, we launched, we were uh, we, we, we met. It was, it was, I think, the first podcast I did of all the different podcasts all that right. I did. So I've done 50 or 60 or 70 or something now. And you were the first and the first. And also, I think I've done it. I think three we've had or three, four, yeah, 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 yeah I, 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 we've had a, a few trifectas, and you're one of them. So if people like our energy on this show; they can they can dig up your old podcast, it, exactly, and, uh, yeah, and hear a few more. So you know, I'm curious, how has your show evolved? Uh, not so much the content, but like, um, or the the uh, the production, but in terms of the types of things the nootropic world is talking about now versus four years ago. Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's a whole lot more talk. I feel like the the you know, if you look at like the Google trends for the word mm-hmm. nootropics over the course of the past couple of years, it's just you know spiking up like you know. Uh, the Andes mountain range, there's a lot more public awareness that these are, are things that even exist. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like probably a lot of that might, might be dovetailing out of, um, like the sports world where people sure. are like, you know, doping in sports and like, oh, if you can dope in sports, I wonder if you can dope cognitively. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and just that awareness that there's a possibility there, um, a lot of people didn't know about it. Now they do. And I, I feel like we're still probably on the, the early phases of that oh, sure. growing public yeah. awareness. And the other thing is, I mean, I feel like with all the brain mm-hmm. research that's that's really getting funded at like a massive um, you know, public policy level, both uh, in the U.S. and over in Europe, they've mm-hmm. got, I guess, two almost sort of competing big brain mapping projects yeah. going on. Yep. That that's just going to be sort of spilling over much the way that like, you know, the space program in the 60s and the human genome project in the 90s led to, you know, decades and decades of um you know, new inventions that would make it out into the public sphere is we're going to be the beneficiaries of that. Those of us that have interest in the brains for, I think, a long time to come. Mm-hmm. So that's a, from a, you know, 10,000 foot view. What about your own personal, uh, you know, nootropic, psychonaut yeah. hacking, biohacking uh, uh, journey? Have you changed how you do this? Well, yeah. I mean, I've, I've gotten exposed to a lot of ideas through the podcast, things uh-huh. that I hadn't, um, hadn't even heard of before. And I mean, that continues to happen because, you know, new compounds are getting invented sure, all sure. the time. And, and, you know, my, my first order of business is when I hear about something new is to try to find a, a sort of a topic expert on that area. So mm-hmm, I can see, mm-hmm. is this something that I would, you know, trust in my own brain or still, you know, kind of sure. stay backed off and just, you know, keep my ear to the ground. Um, you know, and there have been some other practices that don't have anything to do with particular substances or chemicals mm-hmm. that like, you know, at this point I'm, I'm starting an actual, um, for about the past six months, I've been doing a regular meditation practice of okay. about 20 minutes on maybe five days of the week. I, I generally Great. don't get seven days a week in, but I, I do my best to, to try to make it fairly regular. And I think, it, I think five is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm hoping yeah. so. And, um, yeah, I've, I've been intermittent fasting for most of that time, which is something that I wasn't doing when I started the podcast, but I've, I've been hearing more and more, um. And, and, you know, feeling the difference also mm-hmm. with, with some of these practices. I can't say that I've felt the difference with meditation okay. yet, but on the other hand, the, the science seems to be robust enough that 
if, if I'm wasting 20 minutes a day, then maybe that's 20 minutes a day, less sleep that I need or something like that. Who knows? Um, but yeah, so, so I'm definitely, uh, trying out a lot of these things in my own life. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've of course been into nootropics. Yeah. Uh, and other relaxation things, meditation. Uh, of course you're physically active. Right. Um, what's your diet like? A uh, diet's pretty good. I mean, we, well, of course everybody says that. Uh, the, the question is, what is what is the correct what, diet? Well, what, what, what is it for you? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. What it is for me is, um, I've, I've been eating paleo plus dark chocolate. Dark chocolate is the one thing where I allow myself some processed sugar just because I oh, really- Oh, I see. So I dark really, chocolate is not paleo. Well, no, I mean, because it does have chocolate in Got there. It. It's, it's like, you know, I, I guess regular chocolate, like a normal Hershey's bar has even more chocolate, but sure, even sure. the dark chocolate still has some. Um, but yeah, I figure if, if you're going to cheat a little bit, then then cheating on dark chocolate, that's that's probably a pretty good choice. Yeah, absolutely. We actually, we did a chocolate episode not too long ago, and I was kind of like, yeah, there's lots of good things. Chocolate and blueberries have always been two of my favorite foods, and it turns out that both of those have some some good yeah. cognitive benefits. So I was I was happy to hear about that. Great. I haven't done like the cheese puffs episode and found out that cheese puffs are good for your brain. That would be yeah. A I'm not sure that's ever going to happen. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think so. uh, and of course, you know, dairy wouldn't be allowed in your in your paleo. But, right. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm pretty similar. I do a primal essentially, which mm -hmm. for those who don't know is paleo plus dairy. Right. Uh, eff effectively. Yeah. I mean, there, there's so many sort of fine grain distinctions, like, you know, the uh, pesca vegan and stuff. Like, right, where it's right, like, right, ah, right. vegan plus some fish and things like that. But yeah, I, um, I think at the time that I started the podcast, I just switched over from being a vegan for about seven years mm -hmm. into doing paleo. And I, I felt good on both of them. I mean, actually, I, this is something I'd love your thoughts on. I have this weird um, suspicion, I guess, okay. that what might be best um, nutritionally for a person's brain during their younger years, maybe up to the point where you normally probably would have been dying as a caveman, yep. might not be the same as what's really good for long, long, long-term mm. health if you're going to make it to 80, 90, 100 years old. Um, a, a lot of the um, evidence for a, a, a vegan or very close to vegan diet in super old age seems to be really strong. Mm -hmm. And yet I, I'm, I'm pretty persuaded also by the, um, you know, the health benefits of more of a paleo or primal diet during a person's younger years. Sure. Any, any thoughts on this? I have a couple thoughts. Um, one is just a general comment that um, extreme diets tend to adjust behavior. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't, for some people, you can get a benefit, be it in you know, body fat or energy, simply by paying attention and by being somewhat rigorous. Yeah. And so I think some people who adopt a vegan or vegetarian or paleo or primal or whatever diet feel incredible because it's the first time they've really borne down and paid attention to what's going in their mouth. That's, that's a great point. Um, the other thing is, um, I think that the research would suggest that in old age, the biggest things you need to do are control inflammation and control blood flirt blood sugar spikes. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little easier to control blood sugar spikes with a, f a high fat, high protein diet. Mm -hmm. It's a little hard to control blood sugar spikes with a high starch diet. And so if you're a vegan, you can get into too much starch too easily, I think, and you can go into low protein too easily. Right. But that doesn't mean you're doing it vegan right. I mean, that's sort of like the, the, the typical way people fail at being vegan is not getting enough nutrition. Yeah. Um, but if it's a, a, theoretically a, a, a perfect vegan who's getting all their nutrition, I don't think it matters all that much as long as you aren't spiking your blood sugar repeatedly and as long as you're getting enough fuel in to you know, keep the system sort of happy. Yeah, that, that's one thing. I mean, as a vegan, I was pretty much on like the fruitarian end of the spectrum. Uh -huh. I wasn't eating a huge amount of... Um, like you know, he heavy carbs. It was yeah, eating yeah. simple sugars, but you know, I would have like 10, but, but 12 fruit, bananas but fruit a day. Goes, so that's, that's less of a blood sugar spike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, I, I've I've been experimenting some over the course of the past couple of years with um, uh, ketosis, ketogenic mm -hmm, diets mm -hmm, also, mm -hmm. and I, I found that it's interesting, but it's, it's hard for me to stick with because I am such a big fruit fan. Sure, sure. So I'm wondering now, like my my long term you know goal might be to maybe do. Uh, ketogenic diet for like four months of the year during the mm -hmm. winter months, and then you know go back on to you know allowing myself fruits and stuff during the summer. Yeah, you can still rotate with the year in terms of what's often accessible in your air, in your neighborhood or, yeah. your, or your local area. That helps. Some people do eat that way uh, and stay sort of in tune with the seasons. There may be something there. I'm not sure what the research suggests. It's it's hard to say. I mean, like it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me intuitively that that would be that big of a deal because. Like, you know, you and I are Northern European stock. So, you know, our ancestors probably were exposed to, you know, summers and winters that right. were substantially different. But if, if somebody was, you know, growing up or like, or their, their ancestors were uh, closer to the equator, kind of an equatorial belt. Yeah. I mean, was there that much difference between summer and winter? Probably not. Probably not. And, but there also may have been dramatic differences in diet based on subtle differences in ethnic, you know, right. cultural backgrounds or regions. I mean, some traditional pe people today eat mostly fats, proteins. Other yeah. traditional peoples eat nothing but starch. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all healthy. 
So it doesn't seem to be any particular extreme diet causes a problem unless you add all of the sort of diseases of technology, all the you know severely high refined sugars and yeah. oxidized fats and all those sorts of things that we get in our processed foods. Right. I think that's the big, uh, the big issue. Let me ask you more about uh, intermittent fasting. Yeah, yeah. So um, intermittent fasting, of course, is fasting every so often. Uh, how... but, well, I mean, d- daily, but just yeah. for a, a, a chunk of the day. Okay, so you eat in the morning and then fast the rest of the day or vice versa? No, no, I, I'm actually, the way that I do it is I, I give myself like a seven hour eating window okay. between 4 p.m. and 11 p.m. Okay. And, and typically I'll go to bed like midnight or one. So, um, you know, almost up till bedtime, I allow myself to to eat. But um, but yeah, so 17 hours off, seven hours on is the way Got that it. it breaks down for me. Okay. So eating uh, later into uh, closer to your bedtime means you're going to be having a probably an enhanced growth hormone release Yeah. Uh, at night, which is nice. Um, very cool. So um, you, know, you might be interested. There's a... Um, You've probably heard of the resveratrol science. Yeah, yeah. Uh, resveratrol seems to activate um, a gene that causes anti-aging. It's mm-hmm. the same gene that is activated by intermittent fasting. I it's see. the same gene that's, intim- that's activated by caloric restriction, yeah. by cold stress, by the si- basically this, the uh, signal of danger or hormesis. Uh-huh. Right. Hormesis used to be this sort of uh, very woo-woo term. We weren't sure if actually it ever really worked. Right. Now we know that, yes, uh, um, small danger signals or pressures or toxins cause a healing response or a growth response in cells. Yeah. And they see it almost everywhere they look. But sometimes you need to look for a very, very, very small uh, dosage to, to be really see the, the exactly. small uptrend before yep. it becomes a downtrend. Yeah, exactly. And, and some things get in the way of that, like like uh, oral antioxidants. Mm-hmm. If you take too many pill-based antioxidants, you remove the hormetic stress on the mitochondria. Mm-hmm. They don't self-destruct when they're damaged. And the free radical load goes way, way up by taking oral antioxidants. Interesting. Huh. So you can kind of sort of get in trouble by uh, just thinking of this in pure black and white terms about shutting down you know, yeah. antioxidants. Um, I, w- I wanted to draw your attention. There's a new compound out there that seems to actually, not new-ish, but, it's, but it, in terms of it affecting uh, aging, mm-hmm. there's a new compound um, or some new findings of a compound called alpha-ketoglutarate. And if you're a weightlifter or you've done some work, you may have seen this compound before because it's been in workout things for many years. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to activate anti-aging things more than yeah. resveratrol, and it's the first time we've seen a mechanism that actually does not use the CERT genes. It's a completely other sort of set of uh, anti-aging compounds. Yeah. So if you give a, a C. elegans worm uh, caloric restriction or cold stress or one of those other mechanisms that activate CERT1, they live longer, but mm-hmm. they do so moving in a very, very slow, sedentary, right. you know, like they're half asleep. Not the kind of life you want. No, no. If you give them alpha ketoglutarate, their lifespan is extended by 50%, and they zip around the dish the whole time having fun. Wow. Uh, alpha ketoglutarate is involved in the Krebs cycle. Yeah. So um, it's involved sort of like NAD, NADH reductions, and then alpha ketoglutarate punching the, the circle, if you will, uh, of ATP and, a- and ADP around the, around the Krebs cycle. Right. So you, we, uh, I think the theory is that you're actually goosing energy production mm-hmm. in a way that is very you know, good for the cell, so it actually causes less stress. The animals live longer. I, I guess the, the question to ask is, is there a downside? Is there uh, you know, any, any you know, silver lining? Probably not. The inverse of as the silver far lining? as I can tell, probably not. I mean, I mean, this is a brand newish finding. A friend yeah. of mine was involved in the research at UCLA a few years ago, and they found that, oh my gosh, it does look like Mm-hmm. It extends lifespan in model organisms profoundly more than resveratrol does, which is exciting. Yeah. And it does so without the same drop of me- metabolism that most of the other things do. So far, that's, just, that's all we know. But weightlifters have been swearing by AKG for years as yeah. a pre-workout, post-workout recovery. So, you know, bro science isn't always legitimate science, but there's also a lot of self-experimentation that goes on in, right. in those weightlifting communities. Every so often, I think they probably f- hit on things that are really actually quite valid. I'm guessing this is one of those things. There's a reason that it's in these pre-workouts. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think the great thing about bro science is it sort of shines a flashlight on, hey, this might be worth checking out in a, in mm-hmm. a big real study. Yeah, and absolutely. Ha- having sort of, you know, the, the general public involved in just kind of like, hey, look over here, look over here, look over here. I mean, that, that does something that I think is, is a help to big science. Certainly. I mean, big science tends to be the, what's the old metaphor? Well, you, you look for your keys under the spotlight because that's where the light is, not <laughs> right. that's where you lost your yeah, keys. Exactly. That's sort of what science does. It says, well, we have light pointing here, I mean, I mean our tools, our methodology. Yeah. So I'm going to look here for answers. 
and the bro science, you know, are asking questions that legitimate scientists would never think to ask right. or, or want to ask or be caught dead asking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if suddenly there's effects showing up in, you know, body mass or energy or mood, that does draw a lot of attention to, hey, we, maybe we should be looking over there. Yeah. So, so, so you mentioned that they did, uh, like, I guess, flatworm studies. Have they done, yeah. um, you know, higher animals at all, like, you know, getting up into the mouses and I the mice? I don't st- think so. But 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 C. elegans, um, their, their clock genes, their timing genes mm-hmm. are pretty much conserved through mammals. Yeah. So... Um, uh, I have a friend that works on, in C. elegans, uh, Dr. Allison Frand at UCLA, um, and she's uh, mostly looking at timing, how they turn off and on time in, right. in their bodies. So they go through a period of um, sort of insulation. They go quiescent for a while, wrap themselves in a, uh, a sheath, plug up their shell, and then create a new shell and leave the old shell behind, or the, or the, the sort of casing, if you yeah, will. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it looks very much like a hibernation phase. Mm-hmm. It has a lot of the same active sort of secondary downstream genes that mammals seem to use when going through periods of wake and sleep. So the C. elegans clock genes seem to be a model for higher organisms' timing. Yeah. Uh, it does seem to be conserved at least, uh, you know, pretty well across other organisms. We don't yet know. We're still understanding how this stuff works. Um, but no, I've not seen other higher level organisms. Um, but, you know, my studies only translate to humans about 9 or 10% of the time. Yeah. Um, I think C. elegans studies are actually uh, almost that good. Really? Yeah. So it's, it's about a nine percent in terms of psychiatric or, or, yeah. or brain stuff. Huh. It's at most a ten percent transfer rate from a mouse finding to a human finding. Wow, I didn't realize it was, it was quite that miserably yeah, low. It's, it's really low, and yeah. that's often missed. And people, you know, yeah. you see these clickbait headlines that are about mouse studies. They're really not all that interesting. So, uh, so, so why the hell do they do it? I mean, for for nine percent, it almost doesn't seem worth the trouble. It's ethics, you know. You you, you start with right. the lowest complexity organism you can to look for a, an effect, yeah. And then you move up the chain to make sure effects still last. Yeah. So the mice studies probably weren't the first study done on a specific compound. Mm-hmm. They were were done in silica or the C. elegans or in a yeast or something, and then you move it to a mammal, you know, a yeah. rat or a mouse. Um, gone are the days where we start with mice. Mm-hmm. And gone are the days where we look for higher organisms like cats and dogs and pigs and things. Unless yeah. there's a reason to. I mean, you aren't going to study language acquisition in a... Drosophila. You know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's just not relevant. But you can study time and, and, mm-hmm. and the, the way the, the, the sort of cellular molecular mechanism of time in a worm. Because they have the same kind of turning off and on different cycles the same way humans do. Yeah. So... Very cool. cool. So where is your um, uh, show going these days? You're still running the Smart Drug Smart podcast, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, God, I've got probably, you know, 50 things that I would love to do episodes about that we haven't actually, you know, found the right expert yet okay. or, or just, you know, haven't gotten it scheduled. So, um, yeah, I think we're, we're nowhere near running out of topics. So we've been doing um, a couple of ongoing series, things that we sort of come back to. We've been doing a, a Know Your Neurotransmitter series that okay. kind of every 10 episodes <clears throat> or so, like we, we've done one on dopamine. We did one on norepinephrine. And, um, you know, as you know, the number of neurotransmitters, neuromodulators that are out there, yeah, you know, that, that's a, a lot of boxes to yeah, still continue yeah. to check off. Um, yeah, the, there's, I think, no lack of things that we want to cover. So, so what's some topics that you're super excited about but haven't yet got any traction on? I'm just curious hmm, what, hmm. The, what the, like the, the great white sharks are for you here. Uh, there, there's a couple of compounds that are better known in Russia than they are in the U.S. Mm-hmm. that uh, it's just been hard trying to find an English-speaking domain like, expert like on. Like C-Lank and uh, C-Max? C- or? C-Lank and C-Max, uh-huh, exactly. Uh-huh. Th- those are two of them um, that, yeah, right now we, we still are kind of hunting down. Um, have, have you tried those? Uh, no, I have not. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't mean, either. Generally, it's, it's kind of like until I can talk with somebody about it, I'm I'm a little bit gun shy with my own brain. You know, only have don't have a spare. So. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I have that same perspective. I also tend not to be excited about things that I have to inject. Right, um, right. And so for me, you know, I mean, I wouldn't as as a sort of person that produces or designs nootropic compounds. Um, I would never design for the public something that didn't have many, many years of safety efficacy. Yeah, yeah. But for me personally, I'm willing to be a little more experimental. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do draw the line at injecting things. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't need... And also, I, I'm a little suspicious of peptides, and I think these things are peptides. Yeah. Um, as you know, peptides are neurotransmitters themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, peptides tend to act earlier in regulatory chains than classic ligand neurotransmitters. So they're often like an earlier step of regulation. Right. And so the earlier you intervene in the brain, so to speak, I think the, the larger likelihood of side effects. Interesting. Like, for instance, um, Nupept, which is a peptide-like structure, yeah, yeah. it's not really a racetam like paracetam of people, you know, consider mm-hmm. them related because they one was derived from the other. 
But Nupept has pretty dramatic side effects. If you go up and dose a tiny bit, you lose your short-term memory. Wow. Temporarily. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's not, it's not, a, a, not a, a long-term effect. Mm-hmm. But tiny increases of dose beyond what you personally can use is an anti-nootropic. Right. Uh, so it can produce these weird side effects. And so I'm uh, personally a little hesitant to go after things that are on the peptide side of things for neuromodulation at least. Yeah, and, and especially because it's really hard to you know, get the public off the idea that if a little bit's good, you know, somewhat right. more is gonna be better. It's like the, you know, the, getting that bell-shaped curve kind of you know, beat into people's heads that like there is a, a drop-off in positive effects and things is really both important and difficult. There is, I mean, you know, one example of a common peptide, a couple uh, neuropeptides, the most, among the two best known are are, um, uh, vasopressin and oxytocin. Right. Right. Uh, vasopressin in the brain is used for circadian rhythm entrainment, learning and memory in some, in some different ways. And pair bonding too, right? Uh, so that's more oxytocin. Okay. But they are related. They are interrelated. Yeah, vasopressin yeah. and oxytocin are interrelated. Um, vasopressin is released or it's involved in this, in the, uh, um, sexually dimorphic area of the hypothalamus. So it mm-hmm. is, in, it is a, uh, a mating thing, at least yeah. partially, although that's more oxytocin for most, uh, most things we know about. But vasopressin in the body is called ADH, antidiuretic hormone. It's what the mm-hmm. kidneys use to suck water out of your bloodstream. Right. And so if you don't make vasopressin, you pee a lot and you actually go through your whole body weight in water potentially every day. Wow. There's an uh, experimental animal called a Brattleboro rat out of, I think, Brattleboro, Vermont, yeah. uh, who doesn't make vasopressin. And they literally drink their body weight in water or more every day, like just continu- <laughs> continually, you know, cycling through water. Being like a racehorse without actually being a racehorse. And so you can get um, human uh, or synthetic vasopressin. Yeah. Um, it's used for bedwetting. Mm-hmm. Um, and you get little meltaways or little inhalers. Uh, I think the synthetic form is called uh, DDAVP, which is just vasopressin, but synthetic vasopressin. Yeah. Salespeople use this as a nootropic. You take a little hit of the inhaler before mm-hmm. going into a meeting and you're on, you can remember all your details, you're, you're very, very sharp, yeah. but it causes like water retention and bloating. So, you know, <laughs> that's one example of if you have a peptide, a little bit's okay. Yeah. If you had a lot of your, of your vasopressinergic uh, signaling going on, mm-hmm. you'd stop peeing, you'd start gaining water. It'd be pretty dramatically problematic. Yeah. So just an example of how we know a peptide works. Um, we, don't, we know very, very little about the brain still, unfortunately. Yeah. So. Um, We're learning more all the time. We are. So uh, those are things you're interested in, in uh, I guess, uh, getting experts on. What about yeah. things you're interested in trying yourself or other biohacking uh, approaches? Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm, I'm interested in trying alternate day fasting, actually. Okay. Um, I've, I've read enough to be curious about uh, overall caloric restriction as mm-hmm. a strategy, but I also know that, um, you know, A, I, I like to eat. Sure. And... Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering if maybe going like one day on, one day off, because mm-hmm. uh, I, I do generally, even when I eat a healthy diet, I feel mentally sharper when there's no food in my belly. Yeah. That, that's just, that's one of the reasons that I, I set my intermittent fasting window fairly late in the day, that 4 p.m. to 11 p.m., because that way I can get, you know, a full day's work in before, yep. you know, the first food hits my mouth. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if alternate day fasting might be something that would be useful for me. I also read something recently um, on intermittent fasting in particular, that it tends to upregulate both dopamine and serotonin. So yes. a little bit more motivation, a little bit more, you know, feel good mood chemicals. Yep. And um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering if, if, you know, extending that window from, you know, 17 hours to about, you know, 32 hours, which sure. is what it would be if I waited until the following morning might have even more, you know, follow on good effects. It probably would if I had to guess. I mean, yeah. just because it'll make your insulin more sensitive. So at the very least, your insulin will be fluctuating more in response to energy demands, yeah. which is really a healthy thing to happen. Um, you know, I used to do um, years ago when I first started hacking diet, um, not as much was known, you know, this is 25 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And I started, um, doing a form of, uh, low-ish carb. Um, I think the name of the program was like natural hormone enhancement or something. And it was a carb Mm -hmm. refeed. Mm -hmm. So you do very low carb, um, very high fat, very high protein for like four days in a row. And then your last meal yeah. Of every four days was the opposite. It was very low fat, very low protein, very high complex carbohydrates. Yeah. And so what you had essentially was glycogen getting burned or getting used up because you weren't having any carbs for three or four or five days. Mm-hmm. And then you'd refeed the glycogen back into your muscles. And then that would happen again and again. So you keep sucking out all the glycogen, right. re- replenishing it, and then refeeding it, replenishing it, refeeding it, replenishing it. Interesting. And uh, among other things, that seems to strip away body fat faster than any form hmm. of uh, dieting, if you will. Yeah. It's fairly uh, difficult to do. 
to go mm. low carb, low carb. Oh yeah, carbs. And then turn right around the next day and go back to low carb. It's really difficult to do. Yeah, it's like um, you know a problem gambler who gets to gamble on Fridays and like oh well, yeah. it's hard not to do it on Tuesdays if I, I get you know the the restoked every week. That's right. That's right. But hopefully it breaks the automatic behavior a little bit and gives you a little more self control. Yeah. So hmm. cool. Um, so we ran a uh, brain map on you earlier today. Yeah, uh, yeah. You came into the office about 11, uh, caffeine-free, which was great. And we found we, uh, out I do have a brain. We, you do. You do. You know, <laughs> oddly it's enough, I've never actually recorded a brain uh, and not found one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear about this guy in, um, I, got, I, think, I think it was France, that he, he had some neurological problems. They went mm-hmm. in to do a brain scan and they found out that basically he had a big ball yes. of water. Yeah, in he, what he, had a, like, he had 5% of his brain tissue it, left behind. It's ridiculous. And no symptoms beyond headaches. And and he had a little bit like lower than average IQ. It was like IQ yeah. 80 or something. Yeah. But I mean, for, for 95% of his brain yep. being gone, that doesn't seem like that bad. And the residual tissue was different than yeah. typical brain tissue. The interconnectivity between neurons was dramatically higher. Yeah. So this sort of underscores the idea that the brain has more resources than we ever will need. Right. I mean, I've often, often done this little thought experiment, which is somewhat invalid, but the thought experiment is... Um, Number of neurons in the brain, which is between 100 and 200 billion, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, number of glial cells in the brain, which are computational. Yeah. There's more glial cells than there are neurons, so there's at least 100 or 200 billion of those. And every neuron can talk to every other neuron with many processes, so nearly infinite uh, connectivity. Yeah, you get a lot of zeros there. Yeah, if you simply drop back to the simplest equation, which is the information density of just the neurons, so neurons raised to the power of neurons, so all neurons talking to all neurons, that number is larger than the number of atoms in the universe. Ooh. So there's no upper limit of information storage in the brain. Yeah. And it looks like we can lose 95% of our cortex and the brain can reorganize its complexity to handle all of the necessary resources. Yeah. So that's pretty uh, amazing. I think that probably um, points to this idea that we uh, have the capacity for supranormal abilities. Yeah. If we could figure out how to, you know, go in and tweak that tissue in a, in a very directed way. You know, one of the things that I, I, you're asking, one of the things that I'm interested in, maybe that I am now that I wasn't, you know, when I started the podcast three or four years ago, it seems like there's a lot more buzz around artificial intelligence being mm-hmm. more and more of a thing. And I mean, of course it's, it's in the world all around us, you know, when we call up phone networks and things sure, like that, and sure, you're talking sure. for a long time to an AI system before you get to a real human. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, your point there about 95% of the brain being almost expendable, uh, it, it does point to the fact that if we could, you know, we don't necessarily need to have a bigger skull to accommodate yeah, more brain all. tissue in order to potentially be much more intelligent if we were using the uh, the right. wetware resources more efficiently. And there's a huge variability between what a normal sized head is, right? Tiny Tim through, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, under the giant, it's something like... 800 cc's through 2400 cc's right that's a normal range of of adult brain volume yeah that's three times there's there's, there's no way that size matters if a three-time multiple has no effect on intelligence it's like we know that from from kids too it's like a kid you know a kid thinks differently than an adult but like a a seven-year-old isn't like you know uh, just an intellectual dwarf compared to an adult human i mean we know that's not the case and very young kids have more brain cells than adults right dramatically more because the brains haven't pruned the circuits out yet there so. was, um, I, th- I think it was uh, sperm whales or something like that that have the biggest brains, like by volume, yeah. by yep. mass in the animal world. Yeah, and dolphins have um, more gyri and sulci than humans. Uh, mm-hmm. If you look at all animals, as you go up in complexity, meaning number of folds and fissures in the brain, yeah. it's really highly correlated with cognition and intelligence. Yeah. And we are the next to top animal in that <laughs> pyramid. And the only one above us is dolphins who have more gyri and sulci than we do, dramatically so. Yeah. Um, don't seem to have the same kind of intelligence as we do. Right. But have more brain tissue, more actual surface area. Yeah. I, if I can turn this question around on you, like, I've always wondered about that. Like, what what is it about the folds of the brain that actually matter? Like, why does that, yeah. like, sort of gross level surface morphology area. matter? It's the, amount of, it's the amount of tissue you can shove into the brain. Yeah. So if you took a rat or a mouse or a rabbit... These creatures have what are called more a lysencephalic brain, smooth brains. Mm-hmm. And uh, higher order mammals like you and I have gyrencephalic, bumpy brains. Yeah. And the amount of surface area in a gyrencephalic versus lysencephalic is orders of magnitude higher. Yeah. Hundreds potentially higher amount of surface area. If you took the brain of a human and spread it out, it would cover a massive, massive area, the cortex, the actual surface yeah. of the brain. Um, and it's really to get additional cells on board. That's really the only reason as far as we can tell. And it's it's the cerebellum, that area sort of in the back of the brain where it, it looks at, at the surface level a lot uh, like the smaller folds, smaller yes. little crinkles yep. versus the rest of the brain. Uh, any correlation with anything there? 
Uh, yeah, the cerebellum is really a strange structure. It means little brain, essentially. Yeah. The cerebellum contains more neurons than all other parts of the brain combined. Wow. Um, it's really bizarre. The cerebellum is a largely non-conscious tissue, we think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's involved with control mechanisms in the body a very large extent. Yeah. We've got a motor cortex across the top of the head. It sends down about 20 million cells into the body to control the motor system. Right. 19 million of those cells stop in the cerebellum and one million continues down for control. Uh -huh. So 95% of the control signal is used to tell the cerebellum what should happen. Only 5% of the signal actually makes it out to the muscles to control them. It's a big filter. And then there's a ascending sensory fibers that also synapse in the cerebellum, and they compare is what was supposed to happen, what's happening. Hmm. And then it adjusts and does the fine tuning of fine motor control. Interesting. Um, but it's a very strange structure, very much uh, non-voluntary. And from an EEG scientist perspective, I, I do EEG, of course, yeah. the cerebellum's not at all interesting because you can't measure EEG from the cerebellum. It has no EEG. Why is that? Um, all of the cells, the, the pyramidal neurons, yeah. you point the wrong direction. You can't measure them from outside the head. Huh. You have to stick a wire into the actual cerebellum to measure its EEG signature. Right. Um, there's a few structures like that, that when the science gets really hot, happy about their, their EEGs, mm -hmm. I start rolling my eyes. There is no scalp EEG for the cerebellum. There is no EEG at all from the amygdala. Yeah, for just instance, the buried too deep. It uh, has no has no pyramidal yeah. cells. Okay, the pyramidal neurons, these pyramid shaped neurons, are the ones that, in their bursting firing, mm -hmm. produces EEG. Gotcha. Amygdala has no pyramidal cells, so it cannot produce brain waves. Yeah, it might be affecting other tissue that's uh, producing brain waves. Right. But in, you know, people will occasionally say, "Oh yes, we measured the amygdala and found this EEG signature," and I, you know, they've just lost me <laughs> just right away. Throw the red flag. Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. So, so. so I, I totally threw you off track there. Yeah. But we were going to look at my brain and yeah, uh, we should do that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can we go to the uh, the uh, screen? There we go. All right. So um, I for feel folks so exposed. That, there you go. So feel free to stop me at any time if we get into <laughs> well, the. I, mean, I don't know what you're going to uh, say. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, we haven't really gone over these in any great detail. Um, I've just thrown one one set of summary data up on the screen. It includes some uh, frequencies. We call it delta. We call it theta, alpha, beta, high beta. Going from left to right, those are slow brain waves through fast brain waves. The top row is also labeled absolute power. And power is just means amplitude squared. So we're looking at all of the amplitudes in each frequency range on your head. And this data was produced by taking your resting eyes closed baselines and comparing it to a database of several thousand people. And so these maps that show these colored blobs are sort of statistical patterns about how unusual you are, Jesse, mm -hmm. compared to some background population. What, what do we know about that background population? Is that, I mean, most people haven't ever had one of these done. So right. I mean... Yeah, the 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 commercial uh, most QEG databases they're called yeah. are commercial products, and okay. they're and they're created by heavily screened uh, sort of research projects almost, where gotcha. you recruit you know a hundred people who are below age ten, a hundred people who are ten to twenty, hundred people who are twenty to thirty, right, and you end up with you know thousands of people. And then you screen them all for no diagnoses, no psychiatric stuff, no meds, no head injuries, no epilepsy. Um, and you end up with a fairly you know, bland, if you will, set of right. typical brains. And then you're compared to those. So uh, I always make sure when I'm talking in a clinical context, just because you're different than some reference population doesn't mean something's wrong. Yeah, yeah. It just means you're different, you know? But brains are different. I mean, everybody sure. is a special snowflake when it comes to their brain. And uh, in the QEG context, um, I consider these maps prognostic, not diagnostic. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing about what might be true based on what might be showing up in the data. Yeah. But if I say something that's not true for you, we don't, we don't disbelieve you, your experience. We go, oh, that's probably not a relevant data pattern for you, or it's a normal feature for you instead of an ab abnormal feature or unusual feature. Yeah. So um, we're looking at the, the top row is the most colorful. And it has those red blobs. And the, the, between the second and third row, there's a, a scale that goes from negative three through positive three. And these are what are called Z-scores or essentially standard deviations nor, uh, uh, divided by the mean of my sample population. And so we start paying attention to things that are more uh, out of range than one and a half standard deviations or Z-scores. And on, this, on these maps, really, that's the darkest orange and the red. And a few things really jump out immediately looking at this map. One is there's a fair amount of delta and theta brain waves, which are the very slow brain waves. And you've also got a fair amount of beta in the back of the head. Um, we don't love to see either delta or beta um, with eyes closed. Uh, delta is the slowest brain wave. Excuse me. Delta is the slowest brainwave frequency. Um, you make a lot of delta when you're deeply asleep and not dreaming, mm -hmm. but you don't want to make a whole lot when you're wide awake. 
Gotcha. Uh, Delta is um, essentially the brain stem frequency. It runs the heart, the lungs, uh, all the autonomic stuff is a delta driven phenomena. And it's not really a cognition frequency. You don't think in delta. You think in sort of fast beta, low beta, alpha, et cetera. But you, you live, your body lives in delta. Mm-hmm. When you see delta persistent, and I also looked at your eyes open maps and they're still there when you open your eyes. When you see little persistent delta like this, it usually means, um, especially when it's focal like these patterns, that you've actually got a little bit of scar tissue. And what we're seeing, I think, is chunks of your cortex that were bruised or damaged, you know, m- minimally. Mm-hmm. And uh, because they're no longer receiving quite as much input from the surrounding tissue, some of those areas aren't quite sure what to do. And they default back to the, the core default frequency, which is delta. So, so it's almost as if that part of my brain were kind of asleep during waking hours? Yeah, it's very much like that, yeah. And you can sort of see if you squint, there's sort of a, almost a, a diagonal stripe through your brain. If you go from the back right through the left front, there's sort of this diagonal stripe. Um, I'm not sure if this is true. And again, in QEG, you can't ever diagnose. But this looks to me like what we would call a coup contra coup injury. Uh, those are really common in car accidents. When the brain is moving in the back of a car, the car suddenly gets stopped in an accident. Yeah. The brain continues to move and bounces against the skull. And so this looks to me like you may have fallen back onto the right corner of your, of your head and your brain bounced around inside the skull <laughs> and bruised itself in the left front corner a little bit. Um, and so I think that that's what we're seeing. And, and the, the theta patterns also sort of match the delta patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, and looking at, you know, your, your delta frequencies, they right. were running a little fast. They're not typical delta. They're running a couple standard deviations faster than average. So actually the delta and theta we're seeing there is the same pattern. It's the same data. Right. Um, Question. Um, so these are on the higher end of the frequency. We got a, a few of the reds yeah. and we don't have any of the deep blues. What, what right. would that mean if we saw the opposite end of the spectrum there? Yeah, the you saw blues. a negative two or three in, yeah. in blue Z scores, you would be making less than average. Okay. So um, we don't usually see problems in low power. There are a few variants in brain health that are, we call them low and slow, mm-hmm. uh, meaning that your amplitude, amplitudes are small and the whole frequencies are slower than average. Um, definitely not what's going on with you. Uh, yeah. Low and slow variants happen with some forms of aging and some forms of head trauma. Um, and that, and then we would see some blue. But usually what blue means is a slightly thick skull. If your skull is thicker than average, more of the uh, electricity attenuates and you end up with sort of low powered numbers. Right. So it's not usually a pathological problem until it's fairly prevalent. So we don't care so much about the low power variants. The high power variant, in this case, we're looking at delta, theta, and some in the back of the head and beta. Um, these are significant enough that it's extra activity. It's probably something you're aware of. So in terms of what these might mean, the delta and the theta, like you said, might mean your brain's kind of sleepy a little bit all the time. Uh, I'm guessing you're somewhat sleep deprived based on this delta. Um, If you actually have received some head impacts and you have some low key concussion stuff that's, you know, ongoing, then you also might experience sort of a subacute post-concussive syndrome, which would be uh, cognitive fatigue mid-afternoon and a little bit of sluggishness and a hard time waking up in the morning and some irritability. I'm guessing you aren't really experiencing this um, because it's not all that dramatic. It's sort of a, uh, just a hint of this pattern showing up. Right. Um, How, like, if I, if I were to do nothing different than sort of my, you know, every everyday life, yeah. and then I came back in, you know, let's say two months from now and re-ran this, how much would this, do these things change? Great Is question. similarity here? It's a great question. No, it'd look exactly the same. Really? As long as we gathered the data, you know, yeah, yeah. equally cleanly. Um, yeah, QEG is a robust, stable phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So if today, a brain map, and in a year, a brain map, yeah. no change. Interesting. Unless you did something to your brain. Unless you took medication that was different, had a head injury, developed a significant meditation practice. You're meditating 20 minutes a day. Yeah, yeah. That appears to be enough to change your brain in a few months. Interesting. The literature does suggest 20 minutes a day is enough to get the benefits that come from meditation. So yeah, if you really worked at meditating you know, reliably for the next few months, you might see some changes. And I would guess actually all these red spots would decrease. Mm-hmm. The slow brain waves get reduced because you're more concentrated and the fast beta would get reduced because you'd be more, more relaxed. So actually meditation would probably drag most of these patterns in the right direction for you. Um, but it would be a very slow process. Take yeah, some yeah. work to get that done. Um, so other things that might be showing up here, uh, if we go to the right-hand side of the page, we see some beta and high beta. The high beta is really the driver here. And you see a couple little orange blobs in the back of your head. You're about two and a half standard deviations higher than average. Now, this is an eyes closed map. So the back of the head is the visual cortex or the sensory cortex broadly. And usually when you close your eyes, the visual cortex goes idle Mm -hmm. because there's nothing to process. 
for some people, it stays very hot like yours. And that's somebody who uh, they're trying to process the environment visually, even uh-huh. with their eyes closed, just yeah, in case. Because yeah. <laughs> they better pay attention. Cause, that sounds like me. Because they've learned the world is sometimes unpredictable. Yeah. And they better keep scanning because huh. their eyes are closed and they can't tell what's going on. Yeah. So it's a, we call it a hypervigilance marker, meaning Interesting. It's, you know, you're kind of up. Um, and uh, I should say that anxiety markers, of which this is one, uh, are not uncommon. In fact, it doesn't mean you have some like anxiety disorder. It just means you, you have a brain that tends to go into this place. And yeah. also anxiety patterns tend to show up a lot with high intelligence as well. So maybe you're just very intelligent. You also might be a little vigilant, a little anxious. Um, the beta and high beta markers also suggest potential sleep issues. Um, the high beta would suggest sleep maintenance, meaning waking up a, like every couple of hours throughout the night. Right. Did so that, th- that was actually something I was I was going to ask. So because yeah. um, you mentioned that some of these might be, uh, I could have gotten a whack on the head at some point, which I must admit, I, I, if that happened, it would must have been a long time ago because I really and, don't. And remember it could be that. 25, 30 years ago. I mean, it yeah, doesn't, doesn't have to be recent. But um, you know, sleep is definitely something that I, I know that I've got a wonky sleep schedule. I yep. travel a lot and I call different time zones and all that. Um, but if I were to you know be a good little boy and, and you know get my seven to nine hours of sleep every night, yep. at, you know going to bed and waking up at the same time, would that be something where I would start to you know presumably see changes in the delta and theta regions within yeah. a few months? Yeah. If if this is being inflated by sleep deprivation, right. even a couple of weeks of re-regulating your sleep would probably tamp this stuff down. It looks very focal though. It's not sort of broad. Mm-hmm. And so I think there is something going on in terms of scar tissue. M- those areas might have swol- uh, swelled up a little bit because of sleep depth. Yeah. I don't think they would go away completely if you got really well rested. Sure. Um, but they probably would. You're, you probably are right. You, we, these things would clean up a little bit if you were a little more reliably slept. Um, one thing I'll say about you know sleep hacking, uh, mm-hmm. what matters much more than the amount of sleep is when you get up in the morning. Right. Uh, because it's about the, the photo period entrainment, the circadian rhythm. Yeah. So you probably know this already, but when you're traveling in you know different time zones... Try to get some light in your face in the first hour after dawn in whatever time zone you're in. Yeah. So if you land at 5 a.m. in France, wait till the sun comes up, get a few minutes of light in your face, then go to bed. Really? Get that first morning light as yeah, soon yeah. as possible because it turns on vasopressin yeah. in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which tells your hypothalamus it's morning. It's, a, it's the strongest entrainment signal our brains can, can use. Uh, since we're talking about light for a second, yeah. where are you on the, the, how much the wavelength of light versus just the raw intensity of light matters? I, I hear conflicting reports on that. Yeah. Um, I think it matters. I think the yeah. wavelength matters a lot. Um, you know, I use F.Lux on my computers. I'm not sure if that matters a whole lot. I right. notice a lot, except it's easier to go to bed because my screen's getting dark. Yeah. Um, but um, this, this morning light feature is all about the temperature, the frequency of light. Mm-hmm. Um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a nucleus in the brain that sits above the optic chiasm, so it's the suprachiasm nucleus. Yeah. Um, its whole job, or a lot of its job, is to sample the frequency of light the retina sees mm-hmm. so your brain knows what time of day it is. Yeah. There's a lot of a certain temperature of light in the air in the first hour after dawn that's not there. Once the sun's deeper in the sky, most of that frequency gets reflected back into space. Yeah. And so it does seem to be that first hour is critical for circadian entrainment. And this is why I think the light boxes and other sort of light interventions aren't quite as effective because I really do think the temperature, the, 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 the color, the, the, mm-hmm. the wavelength of the light is, is among the most important things beyond the intensity. Yeah. Interesting. So... It makes me wonder, though, for people that, you know, live in perpetually cloudy parts of the world where they might not necessarily have the, uh, you know, the access yep. to that that level of sunlight, regardless of what time they get yeah. up. I mean, I guess our body's got a lot of redundant systems for handling it, things it like does, this. It does. Um, and several, this has several systems for entraining time, but the strongest one is the circadian, yeah. you know, vasopressinergic system. And if that one's not hit hard, you can drift. Your circadian rhythm can drift past the Earth's photo period, which is where mental health problems really start to occur, especially mm-hmm. depression and suicide and things. Yeah. So in Scandinavia, there's a massive increase of suicide in the winter months when the, the sun doesn't come up. Yeah, you know, Seattle, I know, is famously the suicide capital yep. of the U.S., and that's a you know, crappy weather. Yeah, it's among, among the rainiest north. area. Yeah, what's interesting is Portland gets more rain than Seattle. It mm-hmm. has lower suicide. Interesting. I think Portland's also awesome. Portland's also awesome. I think that maybe <laughs> all, all, all the gluten-free food and, and, and weed up there is keeping people less depressed. Right, but, right. Um, uh, yeah, so, so lack of sunlight seems to be a very key thing. Uh, in terms of ways to adjust for that, I, I'm not sure if the, li- the literature uh, uh, bears this out, but I'm pretty convinced that vitamin D in the morning also must be a, an yeah. entrainment signal mm-hmm. because the body makes huge amounts of vitamin D in response to the sun. Evolutionarily speaking, at yeah. 6.30 in the morning, we got hit with the sun. So there must be a vitamin D 
even a weak one, a signal. For, for those of us like myself who uh, supplement with vitamin D, mm-hmm. I mean, that is one of the things that most people are suboptimal in Almost based on everyone. their diet yeah, and their, even, their lifestyle. Even people in Southern California spend time in the sun. Most of us are, are deficient in vitamin D. W- would you recommend, I mean, does it make sense to make sure you take your vitamin D in the morning versus in I the do. evening? I do. I think, it, and I've never seen this validated in literature, yeah. but I have a hunch that vitamin D dosing at night can disrupt sleep. Yeah. Or at least disrupt circadian entrainment, make, make it weaker. Right. And so I'm all about stacking the deck. I don't know if vitamin D in the morning Morning's better in the evening. I think it is, right? And so that's a good enough reason. They're little tiny pills; they're easy to take. Yeah, it's, it stands um, to reason. So you know, I and I uh, just to give it a number, I encourage people to start at about a five thousand IU. Really? So a pretty dosage. that's a pretty high recommendation. Yeah, I mean, it, it 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 was a high recommendation twenty thirty years ago. Yeah. The the sort of medicine and gerontology focus on vitamin D keeps revising upward the upper limit. Mm-hmm. And so twenty thirty years ago, a thousand or two thousand IUs was considered a high dose. Right. Now fifty thousand IU is considered a high dose. Wow. Okay. And some er- elders will get a, a, a prescription of taking 10 or 20,000 IUs yeah. if their blood levels are quite low. How much would that be as far as actual sunlight? I mean, how long would you have to be out in the blazing sun to get 50,000 IUs? For people like you and I who are fairly pale, yeah. if you took your shirt off and walked around in the sun for 15 minutes, you're getting 25,000 IUs. Really? Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. But right. it does take a little bit of skin showing for 15 or 20 minutes in fairly cloudless you yeah. know, sky. Which for me is going to mean I, I, I burn and peel. and Totally. I'm I yeah. burst into flame in 20 minutes into yeah. the sun. So it's a little ridiculous. Yeah. So um, we don't have a lot else to say. I looked over some more of your brain maps. Just to let you know, I did an analysis of your, your brain compared to a database of people that have had traumatic brain injuries. Yeah. And you do not show a traumatic brain injury. Whew. So even though I have a hint of concussions here, some wear and tear, it doesn't rise the level of a TBI. Yeah. And therefore, it probably doesn't mean you're at any increased risk for any long-term brain issues that, you know, TBI is going to lead, lead to sort of long-term problems often, like increased Alzheimer's, increased Parkinson's. Let, let me ask you this. Yeah. So th- this is based, uh, again, on comparing my brain to sort of the, the average middle of the road, you know, Jones's brain, you know, two, two and a half cars in the garage, you know, two and a half kids, all that stuff. Sure. Um, if, if we saw somebody with like a standout, like just an optimal brain, you know, you took your Albert Einstein, you took your yeah. Elon Musk, whoever it is. Would we see them being like a flat middle of the road green or, I mean, are they, no, because probably they not. wouldn't think they would no, be the average person. No, no, because the, uh, exceptional brains are not average. Right. First of all. And second of all, exceptional intelligence comes with, uh, brings with it lots of crap, lots of <laughs> issues. So <laughs> almost, here all, first. almost all these people are OCD, yeah. anxious, and ADHD. Right. And maybe have other issues as well. I mean, Elon Musk is, is a brilliant man. He's not normal. Right. You know, he's not typical talking to him. It's not just his accent. There's something odd about the way he processes So, so, so in, in a high performer, you're also going to see some areas of, of the right. reds the, or maybe yeah. the deep blues even. That's true. And, and, and the goal here is not to make that all green. Yeah. The goal is to identify what you care about that might be showing up in your brain activity that yeah. can be addressed. Interesting. So I wouldn't say, oh, we must make all this green. Otherwise, we haven't succeeded. It's like, well, do you care about your sleep regulation, your attention regulation, some impulsivity? Let's work on those things, and then we gradually see what effects you get and change your brain. I guess that's an interesting question, though. It's like, if, if that's the case, when you see something like this, like, what do you try to aim for in, yeah. a, in a therapeutic session? Because, that's like, I question. don't necessarily, like, you said that some of these might be, like, a, um, some people might feel depression or, like, an uncomfortable yeah. level of anxiety. Yep. I mean, I feel like a certain level of anxiety, but I, I almost kind of feel like that's a good thing. Yeah, you're it makes using you want to get exactly, stuff done. Exactly. And, and that sort of uh, draws attention to this idea, you know, is this medicine? Is this mm-hmm. exercise? Is this cosmetic almost? Um I'm unlike most neurofeedback people in that I'm a neuroscientist, not a psychologist or psychiatrist. Right. And so I'm already coming into this without a medical perspective per se. I'm closer to a brain coach than a you know a therapist. Yeah. And so when somebody comes in, I say, here are the things I'm seeing. And we try to figure out which of them are real in the data. Yeah. And then we identify, okay, of these three or four things, you know, what what would you like to work on, sir or ma'am? Mm-hmm. Should we be working on helping you feel more calm or more focused or more creative right. or less obsessed or having deeper sleep or whatever it is? So f- the way I do neurofeedback, my clients set their own goals. Mm-hmm. And Many of my clients want to work on things that either aren't showing up dramatically in the EEG or they work on some deficits and then want to try, you know, pushing for superior performance or right. creativity or access consciousness or something else. So I'm, I'm happy to try to dial in states and effects people are looking for regardless of what the QEG shows. Right. This just gives us a coarse picture of them. Yeah. And I talk to them about their brain. We start to understand what I'm seeing. That really helps me get a sense of how their brain may work. But from there, we can do a lot of different things, and we often do. So, so if I said, like, I, you know, 
the level of anxiousness that I feel on a day to day basis now it doesn't really bother me. Yep. But I, but I would love to be more creative. I would love to have sure. more like you know light bulb insights. Yep. What would what would the corresponding um, you know score that we'd be looking yeah, for on the brain map um, look like? It wouldn't show up in the brain map per se. What I would look at the brain map is I would look for anything that would contra be contraindicated. Uh, for some of the techniques I would use to break open your creativity. Mm -hmm. um, I use a technique called alpha-theta neurofeedback for creativity, which has been used for like 50 or 60 years. It's used for post-alcoholic recovery. It's mm -hmm. used for creativity. It was used for a while for um, violent offenders in prisons. Um, it works for all kinds of amazing things, um, but creativity is one of the biggest things it works for. Uh, it can really leave you in the middle of your stuff. Like if you have some background anxiety that's not comfortable, mm -hmm. doing alpha theta dissolves any resistance and puts you right in the middle of all your stuff. Huh. Um, to give a sense uh, for those who haven't experienced alpha theta, what it actually feels like, um, we basically get you to a hypnagogic state. So a state halfway right. between awake and asleep. Yeah. And I'm sure you fall asleep at night in that liminal state. You're like, oh, idea. Yeah, yeah. And then you fall asleep and forget it, right? In alpha theta training, we hold you in that liminal state for 20 or 30 minutes at a time. Interesting, yeah. And so stress drops away, conscious chatter drops away, ideas bubble up, emotions bubble up, insight bubbles up. And if you have a lot of anxiety, you're keeping just barely below the surface, mm -hmm. that also is right in your face. Huh. And so it's not so much I would look at the brain maps to go, what should we do for creativity work? I would know that my big tool for creativity is alpha theta neurofeedback. Right. And I would look at your brain maps to make sure we aren't going to knock you over in a bizarre way. Mm -hmm. by training some things up. And this looks fine. I mean, I, I would have no concern that we would make you feel profoundly anxious with Alpha Theta. Cool. So. Well, thank you so very much for having me. My pleasure. Yes, reaching the end of our hour. Uh, thanks, Jesse, for being on the uh, Head First with Dr. Hill uh, vodcast. Sweet. And uh, you'll be one of our first few guests. I think we're going to can about six of these. This is our second one we're recording. All right. I'll probably release this as the second one, too. And uh, as soon as we have six in the can, we're going to start rolling them out uh, probably next month. So, Fantastic. So uh, I'll let you know when it happens. Great. Okie dokie. And uh, folks, uh, check out Jesse's podcast. We'll put them in the show notes, uh, Smart Drug Smarts. And uh, there's a lot of content, a lot of really interesting guests you've had on, and, uh, you know, yeah. uh, to not toot my own horn. But <laughs> three but, of them were you. But three of them were <laughs> me. But besides me, a lot of really great other neurofeedback people, a lot yeah. of neuroscientists, a lot of th really great thinkers. So I encourage folks to you know, hunt up Jesse's uh, podcast and give it a listen. Thank you. So, all right, folks, thanks to, uh, for listening to Head First with Dr. Hill, and we'll catch you next week. 